So we now turn to the third chapter in this part one of the course on the application of functional analysis in the context of Hilbert spaces. We're going to prove the spectral theorem for compact self adjoint operators. Now you already know the theorem in finite dimension. This is the theorem that tells you that if I give you a real symmetric matrix, you can diagonalize it. Uh, it's a very helpful theorem from linear algebra in particular in its application to, to dynamics, understanding what how the power of a matrix um, behave and in solving systems of linear equation. Now, if we have a similar theorem in infinite dimension, this will allow us to solve infinite system of equation and will have application to things like partial differential equations and will have applications to dynamics also in the context of function spaces rather than the context of just finite dimensional vector spaces. This is exactly what we're shooting for and we're going to show that within Hilbert spaces on a certain assumption on linear transformation we can do precisely that. So that's one of the, the very fundamental application of functional analysis in, in spectral theory to be able to generalize such a critical result of linear algebra to infinite dimension, the fact that certain sufficiently symmetric matrices can be diagonalized. Right, so in setting up the scene for that, we need uh, a fair few notation, a bit of vocabulary. So we're going to be working on a Hilbert space. Um, as always, our Hilbert spaces are taken over the real numbers. That's because uh, in linear algebra, all you needed to be able to do things over the complex numbers was to know a little bit of complex number theory. But in infinite dimension, you, you're going to need to be able to do analysis in complex spaces. So you would really need complex analysis to do that. Uh, and because this is not a prerequisite for this course, I have to deal with real Hilbert spaces over the real numbers. So I have a Hilbert space over the reals. I have uh, the set of boundary linear transformation from that Hilbert space to itself. I denote by B of H, right, linear continuous maps. Uh, B stands for bounded, and that's because when a map is linear, being continuous is the same as being just bounded. Now, K of H will denote the set of compact operators. So what's a compact linear operator? That's an operator which is linear and continuous, but also send the uh, closed unit ball to a compact set for the topology of H. Now in finite dimension, every linear transformation is automatically continuous and it's automatically uh, compact because closed bounded sets are compact. But um, uh, in infinite dimension, this is a very much property of the operator and it's quite a strong property because as we will see throughout this course, uh, there are very few compact sets for the norm topology in infinite dimension. Okay. Um, now, the vocabulary of spectral theory, if I have a bounded linear operator on my Hilbert space H, I can talk about its null space, call it N of T. That's the set of vectors that are mapped to zero by T, null space, just like you would have a null space in linear algebra. Um, I can talk about the resolving set that's denoted by rho of T. That's the set of real numbers such that lambda times the identity minus t is a bijection, right? So you can inverse this operator. Um, being able to inverse this operator, being able to inverse a matrix is something that, that is described um, very precisely using determinant in linear algebra. You have very good con conditions to check that. Um, in infinite dimension, this is a much more complicated thing to have a bounded linear transformation that act as an inverse of a given transformation. But we will we'll see um, that we can characterize what this set looks like in interesting situations. Uh, the spectrum of the operator is the complement of the resolving set and we denote it by sigma of t. Now if I gave you a real symmetric matrix, again uh, the spectrum will be just finitely many points, which will be the eigenvalues of that matrix. Uh, we also have eigenvalues in infinite dimension. We call the set of eigenvalues of T E V of T. That's the element of the spectrum that are such that lambda minus T is not a bijection 
for the obvious reason that its null space is non-trivial. Right, so there exists a vector h such that lambda times h is equal to t of h. Now, what's going to happen in infinite dimension is that in general, not every element of the spectrum will be an eigenvalue. That's very different from uh, what happens in finite dimension. Okay, and then the notion of self adjointness, which is in the title here, that's to generalize the notion of symmetry of matrices, and this is expressed in the following way. Uh, if you take the inner product of T of H with G, you get the same thing as if you take the inner product of H applied to T of J. So if you think about it, if uh, I was in finite dimension, this would really tell me that the uh, transpose of the matrix is itself. Right, so that's the symmetry assumption on the operator. Okay, so now that I have all of these uh, notation and definition, we're going to start looking at the properties of self adjoint operators, of compact operators, in Hilbert spaces, building up to a result that tells us that if you're both compact and self adjoint, then in an appropriate sense you can be diagonalized, which is a famous result by Hilbert, which we call the spectral theorem for compact self adjoint operators. Now, uh, on our way to this, let me start with a theorem about or what the spectrum where the spectrum of a self-adjoint operator is located. So if I start with a self-adjoint operator on a Hilbert space, what we're about to show is that the spectrum has to be included in some interval. Right. And what and that interval will be characterized, or the bound of that closed interval will be characterized in the following way. The lower bound will be the infimum of T of H applied to H for normalized H's uh, in my Hilbert space. And uh, the, the, the right hand side of that interval will be given by the supremum of such values. That's what we call the numerical range of the operator. You test what the operator is doing on a, on a vector, so this sort of quadratic form, and uh, the smallest and largest values of this. Uh, numerical range where this bound where the spectrum um, can be located. So first of all we'll have to prove that these things are finite. This is a, a consequence of being um, the bounded linear operator that's self joint. Um, we'll prove that actually these values here just tell you how large the spectrum can be. They also tell you what the norm of the operator is. So you can precisely compute the norm by taking the maximum of these two values. And then if we add the extra assumption that our operator is not just self-adjoint but is also compact, then we will see that these things at the end point have to belong to the, the spectrum, this little m and this capital M. In fact, they have to be eigenvalues. Okay, so we'll prove this theorem. That's going to take a bit of time. Let's just point out a, a direct corollary of it uh, that's going to be very helpful in our proof of the spectral theorem, but it's also just conceptually very interesting in itself. If you have a compact self-adjoint operator and its spectrum is trivial, the spectrum is at most just the point zero, then what does that tell me? Well, you know, they, it tells me that um, the spectrum of T is included, because I know the spectrum of T has to be included in such an interval. If it's also included in zero, it tells me that both little m and capital M have to be uh, have to be zero, and because they're eigenvalues, so they have to be uh, in the spectrum. And so, if little m and capital M are zero, because the norm of t is the maximum of the two, then the norm of t has to be zero, which means the operator has to be zero. Okay, let's prove this theorem. So the first thing we need to do is show that these quantities little m and capital M are finite. Now that's really a consequence of the fact that the operator uh, T is bounded. So let's have a look at M first. So for all H in H, we have uh, T H in a product with H by Cauchy Schwarz uh, that is smaller than norm of T of H 
times norm of h, which is smaller than norm of t in b of h, which is the supremum of the th over all h's of norm 1 times h, norm of h squared in h. Okay, so that basically already tells me that norm, that capital M has to be smaller than norm of t in b of h. I'm taking a sup over h's that are of uh, norm at most one, that of norm exactly one actually. And if um, little m were to be infinite, were to be minus infinity, then we would get a contradiction because um, we will be able to find a sequence H, hn of vectors in our Hilbert space that all have norm 1 and that are such that t of hn hn is in a product tends to minus infinity. But then this would imply this would imply what? This would imply that absolute value of T H N H N tends to plus infinity, as capital M goes to infinity. But we have just seen that T H N H N has to remain smaller than the norm of T in B of H for all N in N, therefore it cannot go to infinity. That's a contradiction and hence little m has to be finite. Okay, so these two quantities are finite. Now we need to show in our second step that the spectrum of t is included in the closed interval, sorry, little m to capital M. Now how do we do this? We're first going to assume well, we're first going to take a lambda above capital M and we are going to show that this lambda does not belong to the spectrum. So it belongs to the resolvent set. Let's see how. So to prove this, we're going to apply the Lax-Milgram theorem. We're going to introduce a bilinear form. So we're going to define A of U and V to be lambda times u minus t of u in a product with v for all u and v in h. Uh, well, this is clearly bilinear because t is a linear map and by property of in a product. And now I want to show that this bilinear form is continuous and it's coercive. So let's do this for all u, v in h. What can I say about uh, absolute value of a of u v, I can use the, the linearity properties or the bilinearity properties of the uh, inner product and this is smaller than lambda times absolute value of inner product of u v plus inner product of t of u with v and then I can use uh, cauchy schwarz and I'm going to get that this is smaller than lambda times norm of u, norm of v, plus norm of t of u, norm of v, and then I can use the fact that the operator is bounded and I'm going to get that this is smaller than lambda plus norm of t times the norm of u times the norm of v, and this tells me that my bilinear form A is continuous and with constant uh, c equal Mod well, absolute value of lambda plus norm of t. Is it coercive? So I need to look at, not for all u and v, but for just all u in h, I need to look at a of u u and show that this is greater than some small constant times norm of u squared. Now what is that? This is lambda u u minus t of u u. And what I can do here, well, the first uh, quantity is just lambda times um, norm of u squared. Remember that I've taken my lambda greater than m, so lambda is fairly large. Uh, and this uh, t u u here 
I could uh, factor a norm of u squared and divide by norm of u on both, both sides, use the linearity of my operator t, and uh, I'm gonna get t of u divided by norm of u um, times inner you know, product with u divided by norm of u. Now u divided by norm of u is a vector of norm one, so this quantity here is certainly greater than, um, well, certainly smaller than capital M because that would be the maximum things we can subtract. So A of U, U is greater than lambda norm of U squared minus M norm of U squared. And because I've taken my lambda strictly greater than M, then lambda minus M is positive, And that's my constant delta of coercivity. So I have a continuous and coercive bilinear form. I can use the Lax-Milgram theorem. And what is the Lax-Milgram theorem telling me then? So by Lax-Milgram theorem, I'm going to have that for every F in my Hilbert space H, there exists a unit U in my Hilbert space H such that for all V in H, A of U V is the same thing as the inner product of F with V. I'm identifying a linear form with a inner product. So the representation theorem, or actually I'm using a special kind, you would say, of linear forms on H, which is just the ones given by an inner product with an F. Um, now, remembering what A of U V is, the theorem is exactly telling me that for every F of H, there exists a unique U in H, such that for every V in H, the inner product of lambda U minus T U with V is the same as the inner product of F with V. But uh, if a vector in a Hilbert space is zero once taken the inner product against any V in H, then it has to be zero. So this tells me that for every F in H, there exists a unique U in H such that lambda minus UT is F. And that's exactly telling me that lambda minus T is a bijection. All right, I'm saying that the equation lambda minus U, lambda U minus T U equal to F as a unique solution for every F. So I'm saying that lambda identity minus T is a bijection, which is by definition saying that lambda is in the resolving set of T. All right, so we've shown that uh, lambda being greater than capital M puts it in the resolvent set. So this gives us that the spectrum of T is included in minus infinity up to capital M. If you're above capital M, you have to be in the resolvent set. Now in the same way, you get the other half of the inclusion. So in the same way, you get that sigma T is included in um, little m to plus infinity. And I'm gonna leave that as an exercise. You just copy the proof of what we've done before. That's a good place to pause the video, go back to what we've just done and uh, prove it by yourself. Now, in the next step, uh, I'm going to introduce mu as the maximum of absolute value of m and absolute value of capital M. And uh, we're going to prove that this mu is actually norm of t. So there's one direction. So we need to prove that mu is smaller than norm of t and mu is greater than norm of t. Proving that it's less or equal than norm of t is uh, fairly easy because if I take any u in h that has norm 1 and I look at absolute value of t u u, uh, what do I get? Well, you know, it's smaller than the norm of t times norm of u squared, which is norm of t, because norm of u is one. Now, mu is the maximum of absolute value of little m 
and absolute value of capital M, which are defined as infimum or supremum of these sort of quantities. So you can find a sequence un of vectors of norm one that converges, that approximate either the infimum or the supremum by definition of what an infimum or a supremum is, so such that absolute value of T un, un in a product of that tends to mu. So you pick that and then what have you got? Well, you've got that norm of T is greater or equal than absolute value of T un un for all n. And this tends to as n goes to infinity mu. So mu is certainly less or equal than norm of t. That's the easy direction somehow. Okay, now let's do the hard direction of this, of the results that we want to show, which is that mu is equal to norm of t. Right, so for the hard direction, um, I'm going to really look at t of u in a product with v for any u and v in h and i'm going to try to control that and then deduce the, the result um, by taking v equal to u so this, I, this is the advantage of really exploiting properties of the bilinear form and then getting to the quadratic form from the bilinear form as you you often do in Hilbert space theory or generally speaking when you move from uh, bilinear form to quadratic forms in algebra so what do we have here? Okay, let's have a look at what happens when I look at t of u plus v in a product with u plus v. What I what happens when I look at t of u minus v, and then I'm going to get from that to t of u comma v. So okay, let's expand this bilinear form. I'm going to get t of u comma u. I'm going to get t of u comma v. I'm going to get t of v comma u and t of v comma v and that's where the self-adjointness uh, comes in t of u comma v and t of v comma u is the same thing so i get t of u u plus t of v v plus two times t of u comma v by self-adjointness now in the same way if i look at t of u minus v in a product with u minus v what do i get uh, i'm going to get t of u comma u plus t of v comma v and then using self jointness I'm going to get the cross term uh, to be the same and I'm going to get a minus 2 t of u in a product with v. So what I can do next is I can subtract one from the other and that's going to cancel out the terms t of u u and t of u and T of v of v and what am I going to get? I'm going to get that four times the cross term is equal to T of u plus v u plus v minus T of u minus v in a product with u minus v. So that tells me something, right? What does that tells me? That tells me that for all u and v in h, I could um, divide by four and I could say that t of u comma v um, in absolute value is smaller than one fourth of, what do I get from the first thing? Well, I can control it by mu times norm of u plus v squared and I could control the other one by mu times norm of um, u minus v squared so plus u minus v squared okay that's interesting um, now I can exploit the parallelogram identity because u plus v squared plus u minus v squared is really two times u squared plus v squared. If you can't remember that, uh, 
I always have trouble remembering it myself. You can just reprove it by expanding the inner product. So you'll pick up a two, and so you'll get mu divided by two times norm of u squared plus norm of v squared. And that's true for every u and v in h. So then there's a little optimization trick that we could play. So what we could do, because it's true for every u and v in h, we can multiply them by a scalar alpha, and we can get that t of uh, u divided by alpha in a product with alpha times v, I'm really just multiplying by one here, is going to have to be smaller than mu of a two times, okay, my u has been divided by alpha, and my v has been multiplied by alpha. Okay, and that gives me a parameter alpha that I can optimize over. And I'm going to choose it uh, in which way, well, I want to u times v to appear. So I'm going to take my alpha square appropriately. So I'm going to pick alpha such that alpha squared is norm of u divided by norm of v. And then what do I get? Then I get that the absolute value of the inner product of tu with v is smaller than mu divided by 2 um, times u norm of u norm of v is what I get in the first term and in the second term I also get norm of u norm of v so I pick up a 2 here the 2 cancel that's mu times norm of u norm of v and that is true for every v and every u therefore the norm of tu Take the supremum of all v of lengths of uh, norm one is smaller than mu times of u for all u in h, and then again you compute the norm of t as a bounded operator uh, by taking the supremum of all u of norm one. So therefore, the norm of t in v of h is smaller than mu, which is what we were trying to prove. Now we have one last thing to prove, and that's the case where t is not just self-adjoint but also compact and in that case we're going to prove that these endpoints of the intervals in which the spectrum is located actually belong to the spectrum and in fact more than that are eigenvalues of the operator t so this is two steps so in step one we're going to show that um, there exists a un a sequence in HN such that uh, the UNs have norm 1 and M UN has the same limit as T of UN. So the norm of M UN minus T UN uh, goes to 0 as N goes to infinity. So how do we show that? Well, first of all, what we have is a weak version of that. So we have that there exists a un such that norm of un is 1 for all n in n and the inner product m un minus t of un inner product with un that goes to 0. That's by definition of m being the supremum of the values t u inner product with u where mu as norm 1. So we have um, this form with the inner product, but we don't have that the norm of the M M U N minus T U N goes to zero. So how do we show that we have that for the norm? We introduce again a symmetric bilinear form. We define A of U V equal uh, M of U minus M times U minus T of U. Let's write it this time. M is just a number, uh, comma V for all U and V in H. Now that is a symmetric bilinear form. Symmetric because T is self-adjoint. And bilinear 
by linear because, well, T is linear and I have bilinearity of the uh, inner product. Now, A of U, U is non-negative. That's by definition of M. And so I've got a symmetric bilinear form that gives rise to a non-negative quadratic form. So it has to be, uh, well, it defines a new inner product. And because it defines a new inner product, I have a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for that inner product. That is to say that A of UV has to be smaller than A of UU to the one half times A of VV to the one half for all U and V. That is just Cauchy-Schwarz for the new inner product that you can define using the bilinear form A, which satisfy all the assumptions of being an inner product. Now, what does that give us? That gives us that M times U minus T of U comma V uh, in absolute value is smaller than M of U minus T of U um, comma U to the one half times uh, M of V, M times V minus T of V comma V to the one half. And um, this can be controlled by what? By uh, the norm of M times the identity minus T which is something finite, um, times the norm of V squared uh, to the one half. So times the norm of V times M U minus T of U U to the one half. And that is true for all U uh, and V in H. So in particular, I can apply that to U equal V equal U N and that, uh, that gives me that m u n minus t of u n actually let's do that for every v that's right that's what i want uh for every v of length one and then i get the norm taking the supremum of all v of m of u n minus t of u n is smaller than norm actually that norm was raised to the one half norm of m times the identity minus t to the one half times m of u n m times u n minus t of u n u n to the one half but now this is just a constant and this goes to zero as n goes to infinity so that completes step one we have that in norm m of u m times u n minus t of u n does go to zero as n goes to infinity so now we can go to step two and we need to show that this un has a limit and that limit will um, be the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue m. So how do we uh, do this? Well, we know that t of un has to converge by compactness. So since t belongs to k of h, um, we have that there exists a v say in h such that t of u n tends to well maybe not t of u n but some some, some uh, extracted sequence by compactness goes to v for some um, n k increasing right and that's by compactness okay i've got it here since t is in k of h so and un is the is in the closed unit ball of my Hilbert space in fact is in this on the sphere so i have this convergence but then okay what is that telling me it's telling me that m u n k m times u n k uh, has to have the same limit as t of u n k which has a limit which is v so this has to tend to v in H, right, but that tells me that U and K, this subsequence of my UN converges to one upon M times V as K goes to infinity. 
So let's call that u, 1 upon m times this v. And what have we got? We've got that uh, m times u minus t of u and k. Well, m times u tends to v, t of u and k tends to v. So this tends to 0 as k tends to infinity. Um, and um, t, the limit of the t, t of u and k, because t is continuous, is uh, 1 upon the limit of the t of u and k is t of u. So m u minus t of u as not 0. And that tells me that m is a eigenvalue of t with eigenvector u. Exercise in the same way show that little m is an eigenvalue this is the exact same proof you have to change your bilinear form to be t of u minus little m times u and then the rest of the reasoning is the same that's a very good exercise to go through it again and that concludes the proof of uh, our first theorem in this chapter three which describe the spectrum of self-adjoint operators in a Hilbert space as being included in an interval and uh, endpoints of that interval are, def are characterized by the numerical range of our operator T and in the case where the operator also happens to be compact then we can guarantee that the endpoints are in the spectrum and in fact are eigenvalues of the operator.